What was the most exciting discovery out of physics and astronomy in 2023? Well, the subject of today's episode is a very strong contender. Today, we're going to have on a special guest who will explain to us Nanograv, an experiment that uses pulsars to detect gravitational waves around the universe. So today we'll learn everything about how this works, why this is different than the LIGO-Virgo way to detect gravitational waves, and also, of course, what this big discovery was and what it means for the future of astronomy. So stick around. If you enjoy the kind of conversations we have here on Why This Universe, then there's another University of Chicago podcast network show that you should check out. It's called The Pie. Join host Tess Vigland as she talks with leading economists about their cutting-edge research and key events of the day. Hear how the economic pie is at the heart of issues like the aftermath of a global pandemic, jobs, energy policy, and much more. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. We've talked before in Why This Universe about gravitational waves, the ripples of space-time that we can use to study some of the most violent events in our universe's history. Today we're going to talk about a method to detect very low-frequency gravitational waves using observations of pulsars that are kind of distributed throughout the Milky Way. A consortium of astronomers known as Nanograv announced last June that they had discovered a background of these low-frequency gravitational waves, In my opinion, that announcement was really exciting. I would even say it's the biggest result in all physics and astronomy of this year. And today on the podcast, we're very happy to have Chiara Mingarelli on to talk to us about Nanograv. Chiara is an assistant professor at Yale and a guest researcher at the Flatiron Institute in New York. Uh, Before holding these positions, she was also an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. She's a member of the Nanograv Consortium and is an expert on gravitational waves Welcome to Why This Universe. Thank you so much, Dan. So great to be here. Yeah, just thanks for taking the time. Uh, Like I said, this is a really exciting result and one that I think a lot of our listeners will be excited to learn about. Uh, But before we kind of jump all the way into that, maybe just remind us what gravitational waves are. Um, People who listen to this show regularly have heard us talk about them before, but it's been a long time since we did a dedicated uh, episode on gravitational waves. So maybe give us a quick tutorial on those. Sure. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time that travel at the speed of light. And they come from, as you were saying earlier, some of the most violent processes in the universe, like merging black holes. And in the case of nanograv, we're looking for the strongest gravitational waves in the universe. And these come from merging supermassive black holes. A supermassive black hole is anywhere between a million and more solar masses. But the ones that we look for with the nanograv experiment are somewhere between a hundred million and a billion solar masses. Bigger is better, of course, but there might only be a few of those in the entire universe. So we typically say a hundred million to a billion solar masses. So these are essentially the biggest black holes that at least we know of that exist in the universe, right? Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's evidence for some black holes that are, you know, just over 10 billion solar masses, but they're very, very rare. We know of a handful of them. So um, if you if you think about our sources of gravitational waves, they're indeed these supermassive black holes, but... Not any supermassive black hole will do. For example, the one at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star, is only about a million solar masses. So that's not big enough to create gravitational waves that we're excited about. But the one in Andromeda, which is more like 100 million solar masses, that one's good. That one is one that would make interesting gravitational waves if it was merging with another supermassive black hole. Well, that last part's important, right? Most of these black holes just sit around kind of not doing much most of the time. It's the special ones that happen to go undergo a big merger, right? Yeah, That's right. And it comes from galaxy mergers. We think that the way the universe works is galaxies form and these galaxies have a supermassive black hole at the center. And when galaxies merge, their central supermassive black holes merge. 
So these supermassive black hole mergers are much rarer than the ones that were detected by LIGO because they necessarily follow a galaxy merger. Can you like put into numbers how rare they are? Like what's the rate per volume in the current universe or something? There's something like 10 to the minus 6 per megaparsec cubed. I'm not sure if that number means anything. Okay, so I've got a million parsec box or a few million light year box, okay? Mm -hmm. And and you said I have 10 to minus 6 of the uh, mergers in that box per year. Is that right? That's not per year. That's integrated over time. So this is a volume density in space. Oh, okay. okay. So the so so one of the reasons that we don't think about the rates necessarily in terms of time, even though you could, is that these mergers take a very long time. Oh. It's actually one of the distinguishing features between LIGO and pulsar timing arrays. So for example, an equal mass, billion solar mass black hole binary starting at one nanohertz, which is a billionth of a hertz. That means that their their period, their orbital period is about 30 years. When they start merging, it takes 25 million years for those Good. black holes to merge. And that's why, you know, we have this gravitational wave background uh, that you mentioned earlier. And because the mergers take so long, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about rates per year because each merger takes tens of millions of years. So we talk more about how many of these very slowly merging black holes there are per unit volume. And Good. that's the more natural way of thinking about it. But it's very different from the traditional way that we think about rates, which is totally valid if you're finding, you know, 90 black hole mergers every year. That's great because each merger lasts a fraction of a second. So that that makes sense. But Good. with the supermassive black holes, it's much more of how many of these slowly and spiraling supermassive black hole binaries are there per unit volume of so, the universe. So to go back to the numbers you quoted before, in this box, this uh, 3 million light year sized box right now, there are about you know 10 to the minus 6 of these black hole pairs in spiraling slowly together right now. Mm -hmm. So to find one of these, we'd have to look at a million of these boxes before we found one. Right. And in fact, that's the way that we estimate that number is by this measurement of the gravitational wave background that we made that was announced over the summer. And and Dan, I have to agree. It is, I believe, the most exciting scientific result <laughs> of the year. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, 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 I'm, I'm unbiased, so I don't work on it. It's not even my thing. And I still think it's true. So <laughs> I, I agree with you. Um, so before we move on, I kind of just want to close the gap for listeners. So can you, we kind of said like a stationary black hole will not be making interesting gravitational waves. Could you just explain a little more what makes the gravitational waves you're looking for between the mergers of these supermassive black holes, the, like what makes them interesting? Sure. So the gravitational waves come from accelerating masses that are very, very dense and so a black hole sitting by itself isn't going to create any gravitational waves. However, if you have two black holes that are merging together, those make really interesting gravitational waves and very strong gravitational waves because these objects have tons of mass that's very concentrated and you can go almost directly to their merger without them distorting each other. They're very hard in that sense. They can go, you know, until their horizons touch and they merge. If you have merging neutron stars, for example, which also create gravitational waves, they'll deform each other before they get, you know, to the very, very loud signal phase. So those signals might be a little bit weaker unless they're very close. And so it's more difficult to detect those because they, you know, break each other apart and they rip each other apart because they're not as dense and as hard as black holes. Mm. So black hole, a black hole will kind of like keep its shape, so to say, so to speak, up until the point when it's event horizon is touching the other black hole's event horizon. Exactly. That's right. And then, of course, things get hairy. <laughs> well, not not strictly speaking, not in yeah, the technical yeah. sense of the term. <laughs> black hole puns. Great. So um, I imagine there are more people listening right now who have heard of or know a little bit about LIGO than they do about nanograv. So maybe let, let's start with LIGO. Go back in time to to uh, the first gravitational wave detections and describe what the LIGO experiment is like and how it works and what they've seen. Sure. So LIGO, um, you know, was operating 
as a collaboration for about 40 years before they made the first direct detection of gravitational waves. And that was a huge amount of work. And LIGO is a ground-based gravitational wave detector. And it operates by having a laser come in and it's split along two arms. There's one laser beam that comes in and it gets split in half. And these two laser beams are separated by 90 degrees. They go down very long vacuum tubes and they get bounced off a mirror. And when the laser lights recombine, they interfere destructively. And so you don't see any light. Now, gravitational waves change the distances between objects. And so if those arms are exactly the same length and the light is perfectly destructive, you get no signal. But as gravitational waves sweep through the Earth, they change the distances that these arms are. So one gets slightly longer and one gets slightly shorter. And they do this kind of LIGO dance where one goes, uh, one one shrinks and the other one gets bigger. And so in that sense... You, you see the light now, the, the distance that the light travels down each arm is a little bit different. And that's just enough so that the light no longer is completely destructively interfering with itself. And you get a signal where you're measuring that recombined light. And so LIGO can measure gravitational waves that way. And this was so hard to do that Einstein himself was not convinced that it was a doable experiment. So it, the announcement of the first detection of gravitational waves was in 2016, and that's 100 years after like, after Einstein wrote a paper predicting them. But it's so hard that even Einstein got it wrong. <laughs> uh, he first didn't even believe in gravitational right. waves and wrote an article claiming that they didn't exist that he sent to the Physical Review, and they sent it out for re- referee reports, right? Like we do in science all the time. And the referee sent it back saying, you've made a mistake. Gravitational waves are real. Einstein said, I didn't send this paper to you for review. I sent it to you to publish it. <laughs> and then he and then he got the report back. But to his credit, the paper appeared the next year and, uh, and the error was fixed. And then he changed his mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So even Einstein can Revisionist be wrong. Revisionist history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, so all I'm saying is that gravitational waves are hard, uh, right? That's it's been a huge challenge to convince ourselves that even if mathematically they appear that they should be real, that they actually are real. You know, those of us who are professional scientists know that we can sometimes take a problem and try to simplify it so we can find any solution before finding more sophisticated solutions. And a lot of us were worried that maybe we made too many of these simplifying assumptions and that these equations might not be physical or real. So there was a lot of doubt as to what we were going to see and when we were going to see it. Uh, So the first, you know, detection was really monumental. I just want to put a little bit of emphasis on what I think is the wildest part of all this. Like, we're, we're not talking about something traveling through space and messing with the laser or moving things around or something. We're talking about these waves traveling through space and changing space or space time, like actually stretching the fabric of space time in a way that you can notice from the way the laser moves through it. That's just mind blowing. It was one of the mm. first really <laughs> cool things uh, I learned about back when I was first studying physics. I, I heard about this idea called LIGO, which of course didn't have results yet. Um, but yeah, I, it blew my mind then it continues to today. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons that it's such a powerful way of measuring properties about black holes. It's because they're moving space-time itself in a distinctive way. And the way that the space-time moves tells you about the black hole masses and Mm -hmm. potentially how they're spinning, which can tell you how they formed. And so these space-time ripples are really rich with information if you can detect them. And what are the kinds of black holes that LIGO is sensitive to? So LIGO is sensitive to black holes that are a few times the mass of the sun up to perhaps 100 times the mass of the sun. And they've detected, I think, something like 100 of these mergers, right? Something in that ballpark? So far, there's been 90 gravitational wave detections. Those were in the last catalog that was published. But they recently started their fourth observing run and their Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter or X account, uh, X is out. I suppose, uh, new potential events every now and again that all look like binary black hole mergers. Um, but the right. the next catalog that they publish will have an updated number count. I'm not sure what that's going to be. 
Great. Exciting. All right. So that's what LIGO does. That's what these Earth-based gravitation wave interferometers do. Now tell us about the technique that Nanograv use, these pulsar timing arrays, and how they can study gravitational waves. Right. So pulsars are in our galaxy, and they're these cosmic lighthouses. There are these neutron stars that are very dense stellar remnants, and they have very strong magnetic fields. And so as they spin around, they can send flashes of radio waves towards the Earth. And this is like a lighthouse. Every time it spins around, you get a flash. Now, these flashes are so regular that you can set your watch to them. And in fact, some of them only lose about 100 nanoseconds over a decade. Yeah. They used to be better than atomic clocks. So these are excellent, excellent clocks. Naturally occurring so atomic for, clocks or something like that, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Like we couldn't have come up with anything better. In fact, we didn't until 2012. And 2012 atomic clocks got better, oh, well, which is I didn't fair. Know that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I had to change my talks. <laughs> so I remember having to like modify the slide, like better than atomic clocks, as good as atomic yeah. clocks. <laughs> the best thing since so, atomic um, clocks. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So, right, so we monitor all of these pulsar pulses. And now because gravitational waves change the distances between objects, the pulsar flashes, when influenced by a gravitational wave, can arrive at the Earth a little bit early or a little bit late. And that's because the Earth and the pulsar are now moving in this gravitationally varying field, right, caused by these merging, well, whatever's making the source, it doesn't really matter, but let's pretend that they're supermassive black holes. And so the pulsars get closer to the Earth and then further away, and then closer to the Earth and then further away. And because the pulsar arrival times are so regular and so precise, we can actually measure those very small changes in the proper distance between the Earth and the pulsar. And that's how we can use them as gravitational wave detectors. So the, the LIGO apparatus is, you know, from one end to the other is several kilometers. Now we're talking about you built, well, built, you have yourself all the, these uh, pulsars that are at, you know, thousands of light years away. So can I just think of this kind of as a naturally occurring LIGO-like instrument that is the size of something like the galaxy? That's right. So it's it's a similar technique to, to LIGO. You're just looking for the differences in distances between objects and then inferring that this is due to gravitational waves. So you're, you're totally right. The pulsars are kiloparsecs away, which is thousands of light years. And the amount of deviation that these gravitational waves induce in those pulsar arrival times, like the amount of difference is around 100 nanoseconds over a decade. Uh, so these gravitational waves are very small, but they're also about a million times stronger than the ones that were seen in LIGO. But they happen at these very low frequencies, which is the next part of this experiment. So these supermassive black holes are very slowly evolving. You know, I said earlier, it takes about 30 years to complete one orbit at the lowest frequencies that we're sensitive to. And so something like LIGO just can't detect gravitational waves at that low frequency. Even though the signal is very strong, it's in the wrong part of the frequency spectrum. So it's the same thing as light. With light, we have telescopes that can see x-rays. We have gamma ray telescopes. We have optical telescopes and radio telescopes. The same thing is going to be true for gravitational waves. Right now we have two operating type, you know, gravitational wave detectors, one at high frequency, one at super low frequencies, and they see different things. So nanograv can't see merging stellar mass black holes because it's just too high frequency. And LIGO can't see merging supermassive black holes because they're too low frequency. So each experiment has its job. It has its part of the frequency space that it monitors for sources. Okay, so that's what nanograv is or how it works. Um, so now let's uh, talk about what your consortium announced last June. Right, so in June, nanograv, together with the European Pulsar Timing Array, the Indian Pulsar Timing Array, the Australian Pulsar Timing Array, and the Chinese Pulsar Timing Array, uh, announced evidence for a gravitational wave background. And so what is a gravitational wave background? It is this superposition of signals 
that's arising from likely the cosmic merger history of supermassive black holes. So think about it this way. If I look at one part of the sky, I'm not going to see just one in spiraling or slowly merging supermassive black hole pair. There's going to be a few of them. And then the further I look into space, the more time has gone by and the higher the probability that I'm going to see another such merging pair. And the deeper you go, the more and more of these there are, which means it's very difficult to detect just one signal, especially if it's not really, really loud. And so what happens is that all of these signals build up at very low frequencies. And again, they build up at these low frequencies because they're so slowly evolving. So that means that at any particular moment in time, there's going to be tons and tons of sources at low frequencies because they're evolving so slowly. And this makes a gravitational wave background. We can't just pick out one source. We're potentially seeing up to a million of these simultaneously, very slowly merging supermassive black holes. So if there were one particularly bright, maybe very nearby supermassive black hole merger, nanograv could maybe detect that as a single source. But in yes. practice, there are some large number of these mergers going on throughout the universe. None of them are bright enough to individually see. So you see this kind of diffuse background, kind of like looking at the milky part of the Milky Way. We know that's a bunch of stars, but we can't discern the individual stars with our eyes. It just looks like a faint glow. That's right. But let, let's let's keep going with this analogy. I really like it. I haven't heard it before, but this is perfect because – Right. So imagine that you just, you know, that you're Galileo with a telescope and you've just seen something like the Andromeda galaxy, right? If you, if you could, it's just kind of like a blurry blotch mm -hmm. and you know that it's there, but it's very blurry. And then as the telescopes improve, right. you can say like, Oh, wow, that's not a blurry blotch. That's a whole galaxy. That's not even in our galaxy. That must be another galaxy. And if you survive, uh, you know, the heresy of saying this statement, <laughs> then you might go on to be like, oh, there was a supernova in that galaxy. And now we can start to see the individual stars in that galaxy. Because at first you might be like, well, it's clearly something else, but I don't know if it's a galaxy. I don't know if there are stars in it. Can you show me a star? There's no proof that those are stars. They could just be bright objects that we we don't know what they are. And so that's what we're doing right now, this kind of uh, archaeology. We're trying to figure out where the signal is coming from, what could possibly be creating it. It's very likely supermassive black hole binaries, but we haven't ruled out other possibilities like primordial gravitational waves or cosmic strings. And so right now we're trying to hone our detector and make it even better so that we can actually try to start to pick up the individual stars in our in our neighboring galaxy to see if they're even our stars. Because what if they're not? That would be crazy, yeah. but it could be possible. Good. So I want to I want to talk about all those like other interpretations in a minute. Um, but before we do, like, how do we know this kind of stochastic noise, this kind of background jiggling of of, of pulsar signals, is really from gravitational waves? Um, like when I saw the first announcement talk, they spent a lot of that talk trying to make sure that they could convince us that that's what it really was. But maybe you can kind of explain that technique or that argument for our listeners. Sure. When we look for the signal and the pulsars, right, we were talking about these regular flashes and how they arrive at the Earth, and they're slowly perturbed over something like a decade. In the case of nanogravity, it took 15 years to find this signal. So it's not only that the pulsar pulses are delayed or advanced a little bit, but they're delayed or advanced in a correlated way. And so that means that two pulsars that are close together will have their signals modified in a way that's positively correlated. So if you can imagine me, you know, pumping both fists at the sky, they're going up and down at the same time. Those signals are moving in the same way. Now, if the pulsars are separated by about 80 degrees on the sky to 90 and 100 degrees on the sky, they're anti-correlated, meaning that I'm pumping up one fist and then the other one is down and then I'm pumping up the other one and the other one is down. So they're anti-correlated. And then um, for technical reasons, for the experts, because gravitational waves are quadrupolar, but if you don't know what that means, it's okay. Uh, when you're back to 180 degrees on the sky, they're positively correlated again. So they're uh, delayed and arrived in a positively correlated way. So nothing else in nature can mimic that kind of spatial correlation that exists 
with the pulsars that we're monitoring. And so even though we had evidence for this advance and delay in the pulsar arrival times a few years earlier, we didn't see that additional piece that told us it was definitely a gravitational wave background. And this is called the Hellings and Downs curve for those of you who have read the paper. But if you haven't, all it is is this additional spatial correlation telling you that the pulsar pulses are positively correlated or anti-correlated. Okay, so we've established that what Nanograv saw is a background of stochastic gravitational waves at really low frequencies. Um, and so far, we've been kind of treating these as supermassive black hole mergers. But there are other things that people have cooked up, uh, particle theorists, early universe cosmologists, that could also make gravitational waves that look kind of like this. What are your thoughts? Maybe tell us about some of those ideas and uh, what the current thinking is about those and in the, in the context of pulsar timing arrays like a nanograph. Right. So first of all, isn't it amazing that the most boring interpretation of this gravitational wave background signal is that it comes from millions of simultaneously merging supermassive black holes? That's the this boring. This is the most boring. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If I had to make you believe something, I guess that's it, right? That blows my mind. It's only billion solar mass black holes. That's all. <laughs> Yawn. Hundreds of millions with a billion one. Maybe there's just so many of them. Who cares, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's the most credible, believable signal, which is amazing, but also highly probable. But you a you're asking me about other backgrounds. So quantum fluctuations in the early universe that happened immediately after the Big Bang uh, could also emit gravitational waves. Inflation would have blown them up uh, to be, you know, perhaps a fraction of the size of the universe. But some of those gravitational waves are in our frequency band. Now, there are details about the cosmology that tells you how strong those gravitational waves should be. And our standard cosmology tells us that that gravitational wave signal should be many orders of magnitude beneath what we can detect with pulsar timing arrays like nanograv. However, there are some theories like the bouncing universes where you have a uh, rapid expansion followed by a rapid collapse of the universe that do predict a signal that could potentially be in the pulsar timing array band. And so... If you want to believe, if you're Mulder and you're going after these theories, then this might be very tantalizing for you. So, um, and for those of you who never watched the X-Files, <laughs> you should watch the X-Files. <laughs> I'm more of a Scully guy myself. Uh, I understand. Yes, Scully was a very strong, positive female role model <laughs> for me when I was young too. And I enjoy her skepticism. Uh, and I don't think that Scully would believe the uh, ekparotic theory yeah, of bouncing universes. I agree. But, you know, <laughs> she was a doc a different kind of doctor. She's It's okay to call her a doctor. She's just a different kind of doctor. So, okay. Um, and another possibility, which was on Star Trek, if we're, if we're now going through all of the formative TV programming of my childhood, uh, was cosmic strings. And so cosmic strings are these very uh, like vanishingly small pieces of spaghetti. And there are these cosmic pieces of spaghetti that have a very uh, dense energy to them. And so if you were looking at one, you could maybe see light bending around it, but they're kind of vanishingly small and very, very thin. And so these can create gravitational waves when they interact with themselves or with other cosmic strings. And so if you take, you know, one of your hairs and then loop it around itself if you're if you have long enough hair that that would pinch off and form a loop a cosmic string loop that would then radiate gravitational waves as it evaporates and then it would release all of its energy in gravitational waves and disappear so depending on these loop sizes you can create a gravitational wave background that's in the pulsar timing array band but it depends on what the energy density of these strings are how, and how big the loops are. And so if you want to believe in cosmic strings, um, and the, the jury is out on that, I think, you know, physics also has fashions, and it was very in vogue for a while, and then kind of out of vogue, but now sort of in vogue again. I don't really have an opinion about it. I would think, personally, that it, the most amazing explanation of what we found is that it's all of the above. 
And that would be wild. But maybe that's too wild. Back in the 90s, people thought that cosmic strings might have been responsible for like how the large scale structure of our universe formed. But cosmic microwave background measurements told us that wasn't the case. And then people forgot about them for a long time, it seems. And then like, well, maybe it's not most of the energy in our universe, but it could still be a small amount. That would be cool still. After all, cosmic strings, even if there's only one of them, would be super exciting. And, uh, and Nanograph can look for them. I yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's it's so cool that we don't really know yet because now it's just the time where everyone's going to be dreaming and what a beautiful, creative time. Everyone's going to come up and be incentivized to create beautiful ideas and a lot of them probably won't work out, but what if someone reads that idea and then gets a new idea that mm-hmm. works? This is just going to be such a creative renaissance in the field. I think I can't wait to see what people dream up of. Well, and, and another thing I like about this is like, even if what Nanograph is seeing, it, it turns out we learn concretely that it's a bunch of supermassive black holes merging or something. We'll be able to test a variety of exotic scenarios for the early universe. And we'll be able to say, well, these theories, these, these otherwise viable, you know, hypotheses for what went on in the early universe are ruled out. And uh, the idea that you can like look at these ripples of space time throughout our universe and know something about what happened in our universe when it was, I don't know, 10 to the minus 32 seconds old or something, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty great. I strongly agree. <laughs> All right. So I've got one more question for you. Um, and it's just, I want to, well, let me play the, put down the, 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 the framework. So a year ago, I wasn't expecting pulsar timing arrays to have the kind of positive result that Nanograph announced in June. I didn't realize it was that in, in the near term uh, realistic that it would happen. Uh, so what I'm asking now is like, what should I expect gravitational wave science to look like in the, in the next year, in the next five years, the next 20 years? Like what, what does the future hold in this exciting field of science what are the experiments or telescopes that I should keep my eye on? What are the the things we're likely to learn? And what are things that maybe will be harder to learn? Wow, what a beautiful question. So let me share with you my vision of this gravitational wave landscape. So in the next few years, if the gravitational wave background really is sourced by supermassive black hole binaries, which I strongly believe that it is, but maybe also something else, but it's going to be an and, not an or, we're going to necessarily need to find these individual in-spiraling supermassive black hole binary systems. And so we're not sure yet if we will find those first or a kind of anisotropy that those induce in the gravitational wave background. So similar to the cosmic microwave background that has these uh, bumps and these temperature fluctuations, and you can measure its anisotropy and then learn new science from that, this uh, astrophysical gravitational wave background, if it really does come from these supermassive black hole binaries, should have similar fluctuations. There should be uh, perhaps a little bit more power coming from one part of the sky than another part of the sky. Uh, we're not really sure how that power is distributed over the sky, although I've done a lot of work thinking about that. Um, but this kind of anisotropy just means that it's a deviation from something that's completely smooth and, you know, the same in all directions. So you should be getting little hot spots of gravitation waves over the sky. So if there is a something nearby that's very loud, we might just find that first and be able to create a model for that noise and then effectively take it out of our map and then look underneath to see if we can find these little fluctuations in the gravitation wave background. And then again, now you now you go to the next level. So what's inducing this anisotropy? You were mentioning large scale structure. That's ab- That could be one thing that's inducing this anisotropy in the gravitation wave background. Does it follow large scale structure? Does it not? If I find a hot spot on the sky with more power than another part, and then I take something like JWST and look at it, what happens if there's no black holes there? There's no galaxies there. What does Mm -hmm. that mean? I have no idea. So individual sources, these continuous gravitational waves, uh, anisotropy and the gravitational wave background. And that takes us maybe, let's just say 10 years into the future. Now is the decade of LISA which is a gravitational wave detector in space. 
And it's taken all of my strength to not talk about Lisa until now, especially when we were talking about the gravitational wave spectrum. Because Lisa, this gravitational wave detector in space, is going to be a constellation of lasers. So they're going to form a triangle. And they can find the baby supermassive black holes that we can't find with nanograph. Nanograph finds the really big ones. And Lisa can find the 10 to the 6 solar mass one. So the million solar mass black holes like Sagittarius A star, if it would merge with a similar mass one or even with a black hole a thousand times smaller, it could create a gravitational wave signal that's detectable with this space-based uh, interferometer. So it's not exactly LIGO in space, but if you think about that, you would not be completely wrong. And the frequency of this is right smack in the middle. It's right in between LIGO and pulsar timing. So LIGO is very high frequency, LISA is, let's say, mid-frequency, and then gravitational waves with nanograv are very low frequency. So LIGO is also going to get an upgrade. It might be called Cosmic Explorer or Einstein Telescope, but there's going to be something like that in the next 20 or 30 years uh, buried deep underground so that you can really minimize the amount of noise caused by things like clouds passing mm -hmm. overhead or gravity gradients in the Earth. These kinds of things really do affect gravitational wave detectors, because with LIGO, you're looking for something that's changing, you know, something as small as a fraction of a diameter of a proton. And so that's hard. That's really hard to measure. You need to be really sure about what you're measuring. And so you need to control as many variables as you can. So as you go deeper underground, you're more isolated. And that really helps with especially the very low frequency part of the detector. Once of, of the LIGO detector, which is a, at around a few hertz, not a nanohertz, a mm -hmm. few hertz. And then if you can clear up that part of the detector, you can start to see neutron stars in spiraling. And that's something that right now is very, very difficult to see. Um, but you could possibly start to see that. And that can tell you things about the neutron star interiors and other fun things that you just can't create in a lab. So that takes us up to maybe the 2040s, 2050s. And, um, and then I just don't know. <laughs> and, and that's cool. Yeah. It, it's hard to predict anything in science beyond the 20, 25, 30 year horizon. Uh, can you imagine a hundred years? A hundred years. In a hundred years, we probably, no, I can't. <laughs> no, I mean, no I would know. love and, to. I've, I've, I've never let myself think about a hundred years. And try to imagine somebody in 1923 trying to guess what science would be like in 1953. Like, no way you could have mm -hmm. done it. It would have been completely inconceivable. Like, you wouldn't have understood quantum mechanics. Um, you, yeah. you you didn't know that the Milky Way was a galaxy yet. Like, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty hard to foresee yeah. where, uh, that, where science was going to go yeah. at that time. Yeah, totally. So we're probably going to make huge advances in cosmology and our understanding of the universe. Um I can imagine in terms of physical realities, probably scientific colonies on the moon where there's less radio frequency interference for very practical reasons. That is until someone puts Wi-Fi on the moon, <laughs> then, then it's game Let's over. hope they don't again. do that right away. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. Um, anyhow, yeah, I, I definitely can see radio arrays on the moon. Uh, where, you know, things are going to be very cold and not very noisy. That would be awesome. Uh, I could imagine really sensitive tests of general relativity and using black holes to test how, you know, quantum gravity could possibly work, trying to find experimental evidence of the unification of general relativity and quantum mechanics with black holes, right. because really that's where they need to mm -hmm. meet right? You have this very small singularity in the center of your black hole. If you need to get things right anywhere, it's there. And how does that mm -hmm. work? And I do think that there is a solution. And um, that might lead us to a whole paradigm shift. And, you know, maybe we haven't really been thinking about gravity in the right way, or maybe we haven't been thinking about anything in the right way. And some brilliant graduate student will come up with her own theory, and it'll all just very naturally fall out. So I'm looking forward to these big paradigm shifts as well. We tend to have one every hundred years or so. We might even know what dark matter is. <laughs> one can right? dream. All sorts of crazy, right? All sorts of crazy things can happen in a hundred years. Wow. 
Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's edited and produced by me, Shalma Wegman, and my co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. If you like our show and you want to support us even more, you can find us on Patreon. There you can access ad-free episodes of the show, as well as exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes where you get to ask Dan and I direct questions about physics or anything else. So if you are curious about that, you can find it at patreon.com slash whythisuniverse. Thank you so much for listening and for your support.